bow to pray for a minute. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful. Thank you for making it possible for us to gather again together. Lord God, our gathering is unto you. Thank you for the freedom to worship, freedom to teach, freedom to preach your word. As we enter in the word this morning, we do not enter in presumptuously, but rather we enter in, Father God, reverentially, being fully conscious and aware of our human shortcomings, human uh, inabilities, Lord God, to deliver your word <clears throat> with the wisdom that is in it at the level at which we should. And therefore, we come to ask you to help us. We can't do it by ourselves. Consequently, we pray for fresh unction and anointing, firstly upon my heart and my lips, that indeed I would speak as an oracle of God as I should. Secondly, upon the ears and the hearts of everyone who will hear me, those who are physically present, those who will be hearing me remotely, electronically, so that this word will flow freely from you through me to the people to do an internal and eternal work in every heart, including my own. In particular, to cause our wills to become more humble, minds to be more enlightened with revelation knowledge, emotions to be more controlled, tempered, and by the power of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We further pray as we speak, the power of the Holy Spirit be released in great measure to follow these words wherever they are heard and released in all the earth. Power that will heal, power that will deliver, power that will break yokes, power that will free men so that they will become doers of the things which they hear and not hearers only. We further pray for mercy to be faithful, to deliver the word, Father God, with precision. Yes, to redeem the time and say only what you want me to say. Bringing out of the treasure of this word things new and old, indeed as a scribe instructed unto the kingdom. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And all those in agreement with me receiving every blessing I mentioned in their own individual life agreed and said, Amen. First Peter, the fifth chapter, we stopped in our last lesson in uh, about verse 10, where Peter was telling us uh, that as Christians, as we walk with God, God will gradually uh, uh, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle us. The thought pattern from here, or rather in, these, in this portion of Scripture, is that as Christians, and this uh, thing that has not been uh, as clearly understood as it should be, but we thank God for fresh revelation and light on God's Word, particularly in these last, uh, in, in these last few years. You know, he says, you know, the, the thought pattern is from verse 8, you know, where he says, Be sober and be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as roaring lion, walks about seeking whom may devour. That's a fact. Now, the, the good news is you can resist the devil. He says, Resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in the world by your brethren in the world. In other words, it's not only you who's going through a tough time. Praise the Lord. Every Christian, every serious Christian, should I add that word, you know, is going through a tough time. You know, most people don't understand that, you know, most people think that, you know, if you are attacked by the devil, it's because you did something wrong. It's the exact opposite. If you are attacked by the devil, it's because you're doing something right. The Bible says, you know, affliction arises for the word's sake. It is the people who are doing the word of God that attract the most uh, satanic attention and satanic attack. And that's something you need to hold on to and understand. Uh, in my Bible reading today, I was in the book of Job, my personal Bible reading, you know, and this thought occurred to me. You know, Job's friends, they were, you know, they weren't bad people, but they, 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 they started accusing Job and said, what's happening to you is because you must have done something wrong, particularly morally, particularly morally. They said, you know, maybe you didn't help the widow. They, they, they listened to all kinds of, you know, I can't remember which chapter it was. I think chapter 20 something. You know, they, they, they said, you know, you must have, you know, sent away the wicked, you know, um, the, the poor hungry. You must, maybe you didn't help the widows. Uh, you know, maybe you slept with somebody else's wife. You know, you must have done. God is not a bad God, Job. Fuck, I can't count all your children just dying one day. 
all your children die in one day, you lose all your wealth in one day, you lose your health, and you tell me that you didn't do anything wrong, and you're not trying to tell us that you are you know more than God. That was what they were telling him. You know, and and and, and poor Job, <laughs> you know, he wasn't a he wasn't a he wasn't a quandary. He was wondering. I'm telling you guys, I haven't done anything like that. In fact, on the contrary, all those things you are saying, I do them. And he was he was sure of himself in that regard, you know. And and I was wondering where where this thing came from. You know, sadly, they didn't have the book of Job to turn to. Like we do. You know. No, it wasn't because Job was, was doing something wrong. It was because Job was a good man. God himself said, have you considered my servant Job? He said, there is none like him in all the earth. He's righteous. So it's, you, the point here is this. When you're living right and doing good things does not mean you will not be attacked. You know, and of course, Job had a loophole in his life, which was, you know, omission of some spiritual laws. Okay? But even when you're doing the spiritual law, you're still attacked. Another good example of that is Daniel. Daniel was doing everything right. He was praying. He was, he was keeping the, the word in his heart and his mouth. He was obeying the, the, the laws, you know. Yet, you know, he, you know they, 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 they put him in lion's den. Why would you put somebody who's doing the right thing in the lion's den? Oh, let's, let's say it in another way, you know, that, that will get more of our attention. Why would God allow that kind of thing to happen? You see, and that's the point where many Christians get offended. Especially when they're doing the right thing. I'm doing the right thing. And, and, and here is God, you know, you, you know what, what was God looking at? When they even made such a decree. I pray three times a day. I'm talking about Daniel now. Why would God allow such a decree to be made for me to be? And you know, if you get into offense, you have just died. That's right. The one scripture you need to hold fast to, and it is this. Great peace have they who love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. Make up your mind now before the problems come. That no matter what comes, my attitude to God will never change. And that was what saved Job. Job said, though he slay me. I don't understand what's going on. I don't fully know why God has allowed this thing to happen. But whether he has, you know, the, what, what is certain that I know is that God doesn't change. God is a good God, and even if he kills me, I will still serve him. Now, that is the attitude of a winner. That is what the scripture means when it says, and they love not their lives unto the death. And it's that attitude, you know, sadly, that is absent in the hearts of so many Christians. You, know, you, you go, Listen to the average Christian quote Revelation 12, 11. The blood of the Lamb and the word of the Lamb, and that's where they stop. Because it's not in their heart. Most people think, oh, you know, that's why you see this, you see this frantic, you know, where you see people doing things frantically is usually out of fear and unbelief. It's not faith. Even though they are saying all the right words. You see this frantic something, by the blood. You know, splashing the blood all over the whole place. They're splashing on their car, splashing on the expressway. He's afraid <laughs> that he's going to have an accident. You know, and thinks that just by, 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 by just saying the blood, you know, uh, you know, no weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. Now, those things are not wrong, they're right, but you must do them in faith, not fear. And you must also have this attitude at the baseline, at the bottom, that though he slay me, I, I would not, you know, I will not be offended, yet will I praise him. When that attitude is in place, you know what is you know what you just got rid of the fear of death. Amen. And once the fear of death is gone, do you understand? You're in a very good place to fight. Amen. See, even in, in, in ancient Israel, you know, in the Old Testament, whenever they went to war, when they got to near the war front, the, God told the commander, he said, Turn. He says, If anybody is afraid, he said, Let him go back. He said, Lest because fear is contagious. You know why it's a spirit. He said, lest when he fights and he dies, you know, and then his fear is transmitted to the other, and the hearts of the other people will weaken. You know, are you not thinking it's true for us today? Our Christians, they're praying, but many Christians don't pray in faith. 
They pray in fear. They pray out of desperation. You know, and, and, and hoping that God will do something, you know, by, 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 by hearing my fear. God doesn't operate by fear. He operates by faith. Now, let me, let me, put, a, let me put a cross on that because, you see, God is also a kind and a merciful God. You know, he's telling us over. When he sees that the person is afraid, you know, and, and uh, they're full of fear and they, and they cry, many of you go and look for somebody else who has faith and take their prayers. That's why praying in tongues is so important. When you pray in spirit, go, go, and go and take somebody else's prayer and cover for them so that, it doesn't, so that nothing happens to them. Praise the Lord. But it was not because of the desperation that the prayer was answered. It was in spite of it. It was not because they pleaded the blood of Jesus, you know, out of fear, without faith and understanding, that they were protected. They were protected in spite of not doing because of the mercy of God. God's God is merciful. So he, you know, even when they do, when Christians say and do all kinds of silly things and wrong things that they shouldn't do, you find that God's mercy covers. That's why his tender mercies are over all his works. It's God's nature, you know, to be merciful. But having said all of that, you know, uh, um, God expects us to grow. And he expects us to get to a point where we don't pray like that anymore. We don't pray out of fear, you know, and, and uh, you know, and out of desperation. You know, we have to pray in faith. So even when you're facing, that's what Peter is saying. He says, who resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished by your brethren in the world, you know. And, 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 and you will overcome him. And we summarize this. I'll just repeat it. It bears repetition because that's how emphasis drives home a point. You know, as Christians, we're supposed to suffer two, th- two sets of things. You know, one, self-denial. Two, affliction. Now, they're closely connected. It is the self-denial that gives you extra time to pray and, and, and release the power of God in sufficient measure that will now overcome the affliction that will come. Is this clear? It's very, the, God has made it very clear to us recently. It didn't used to be clear. We used to model all of it up. Praise the Lord. Then another thing about affliction you have to understand is this. God allows affliction to be able to have a legal case against Satan to be able to put away Satan and all his people. The Bible says, you know, the, the, the manifest, the manifest uh, um, judgment of God. The God considers the righteous thing to recompense tribulation on those that trouble you. The point is this. If they don't trouble you, God has no righteous basis to be able to put them away. That is why he allows it. The enemy will come in like a flood. That's why God allows it. But the good news is that God's not just going to sit there and let him come and steamroll you. He will allow him in with all the intention to kill and de- steal and destroy. Now, when he has entered, he is legally culpable. God will only move after he has entered, not before. Because if he hasn't entered, there is no legal basis for, for, for punishing him for that attack. Is it clear? And it's only people who have faith and who, are, who know God. They did not know their God shall be strong and do Who know, who understand God's righteousness, who understand God's faithfulness, who understand that God isn't just allowing them to go through a hard time for nothing, understand what God is doing, and whose hearts are fixed and will not be offended, that, uh, that will be able to deal with the devil and say, God, let him come in. It's okay. You know, and when he comes in, we get back inside there with God, hallelujah, and we counterattack. And it's after we counterattack and overcome him, then, you know, we get the victory. But God has got the legal basis now to punish Satan. And that all is a win-win situation. You know, and, and that's why you have to understand, you know, what is going on. Many Christians don't understand. They're still like Job. And you shouldn't be like Job because you've got the book of Job. <laughs> Hallelujah. Job, Job, yeah, you, you, you know, you know why all those things are happening. Job didn't know, but you do. So when those things happen, you say, God, thank you. That's how you can thank God in everything. 
No matter what is going on, you can say, Father, thank you. And, and we know, you know, one of my favorite scriptures there is Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continue to stand in prayer. And then in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You but if you can say, Father, thank you. And then you're praying in tongues, you're praying in spirit and all that. But your heart is saying, Father, I thank you. You're helping me. And we're going to get the victory over the situation. You know, you're operating in faith. That's why it says Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Is it clear? And so the, the, these are the things that we, that we shared, you know, with us. And then God told us uh, uh, in verse 10, he says, when you do this, ask, let, me, let, me, let me paraphrase. It doesn't say it exactly like that, but that's what it implies, you know. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto eternal glory, after you have suffered a while. In other words, as you practice overcoming the devil, when through suffering, self-denial, on one hand, you know, which, which primarily involves, it's not the only thing, that's why it's the word primarily, you know, denial of food and sleep. You know, that's what, you know, that basically that's, that uh, you deny other things too. But food, you know, so you can pray and, and fast. It doesn't mean you fast all the time, but you know, and then, you know, what I've taught over the years, and Jesus taught this to Kenneth Hagin. You know, and I learned from it, you know, in one of the visions, living a fasted life. It doesn't mean you don't eat. You just don't eat that much, you know. And then you, 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 you're also careful when you eat, how much you eat, you know, the timing and the, and the quantity. So that you can be in a spiritually strong position to do the things you need to do, you know. And then sleep. That's why you pray all night prayers. That's why you have days when you get up much earlier to pray. These are the co characteristics of spiritual victors. Check it down through the ages. All the great men of God have operated these principles. John Wesley, you know, uh, 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 um, Old Wigglesworth, you know, all, uh, in our contemporary age. And you see this in the Bible. You know, the Lord Jesus himself. You see him doing all night prayer. You see him getting up early in the morning to pray. You see him living a fasted life. You know, there's nothing he has told us to do he didn't do. So that's what the cause suffering constitutes. You know, basically, denial of food, denial of sleep to some degree, so that you can have time to pray, you know. And then when you're praying like that and you're praying without a season, you generate the power to overcome the afflictions. Now, as you practice these things, self-denial, overcoming the afflictions, God will be working. That's what it says, after you have suffered a while. In the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the process of that suffering of self-denial and on overcoming the afflictions and the attacks that come, you grow spiritually. So as that process is taking place, you go through four stages. God will perfect you. Or what I taught last time in detail, you know, what I call cleansing perfection. Then God will establish you, you know, uh, or rather dominion perfection, then cleansing perfection. Then God will now, um, um, there's a third one there. Thank you. Strengthen you. That's manifesting, you know, equivalent to manifesting perfection, where the life of God, the power of God is now manifest in not just one member like it used to through your tongue, in all the members of your body. That's why people can touch you and get healed. People can take, you know, bring a piece of cloth, touch your body, you know, and the power of God will go through it, you know, and, 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 and get people healed and delivered. And then finally, God will settle you, which speaks of permanent perfection. So all these four stages. But... The, the watch this, you know, the passageway to this is suffering. You are not going to enter into perfection and get a crown of glory. The crown of glory just means you become a spiritual king, then you are crowned with that crown of glory so that the glory of God is manifesting you through, through you constantly. Jesus was crowned. Hallelujah. He, he was a, uh, of course he was a king when he was a baby, but he wasn't crowned then. Amen. It was when he was 30 years old and the spirit of God, without measure came upon him, you know, and he began uh, that he now became a king. And with the same thing with us. So as you grow spiritually, you get a place where God can, can trust you. You know, your character is developed, your heart is developed, your mind is developed, your will, your emotions, all of that. Uh, and all that has 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 happened through the suffering now i want to make this
distinction I have in the past, but it bears repetition. It is not the suffering alone that perfects you. So you, you, you know, your people always, they, you can always take truth and twist it. That's why the Bible says, handle the word of God deceitfully. You know, so suffering is not what perfects you. It's using the blood, the word, and the spirit through the sufferings that perfects you. So the agents that actually perfect you are the blood, the word, and the spirit. But they cannot do their work. They do their work in the midst of the suffering. Even when you are fast, they're catalysts. You know, even when you are fasting and praying, you're going to be using the blood, the word, and the spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. In self-denial. I you to me, when attacks come and you have to overcome it, you're still going to use the blood, the word, and the spirit. So th- those are the major agents that are causing the perfection on the inside. Amen. The sufferings are just the external things that the enemy brings, you know, which God allows to have a legal basis against him. But it's not the sufferings themselves that got you perfected. You will never find anywhere in the Bible where this suffering will perfect you. You say the blood perfects you. It says the word perfects you. It says the power of the Holy Spirit perfects you. Amen. But for those things to perfect you, you have to go through sufferings. Is it clear? It's important that these things are clear in our thinking and in our understanding. So we don't get all muddled up. Praise the Lord. You know, you, you can go to one extreme or the other way. Just let the devil come in and, and, and just finish you and say, well, you know, I'm suffering for Jesus. No, that's not, that's not, that's not what he meant. Hallelujah. Yes, you suffer, but you didn't mean you suffer defeat. And looking again at the example of, of, of Joseph and Daniel, they're very, very good examples. Joseph suffered. He suffered for righteousness sake. He did the right thing and wound up in jail. Are you listening to me? And you'll be wondering, why would God allow such a thing? For the same reasons I mentioned. But Joseph stayed sweet. While inside the jail, he continued to operate his spiritual laws. He didn't have a Bible in those days, but he continued to say the word of God that his father had taught him and, 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 and what he had known about, you know, Jehovah, the God of Abraham, of, of uh, Isaac, and Jacob, his father. It was in the operation of all of those things that his attitude and everything remained good. So when he now saw these guys who were sad one day, he said, what's wrong with you? He said, ah, you guys, you haven't eaten this morning. What's wrong with you guys? So I had a dream. He said, come on, tell me the dream. Joseph had no idea that that was the beginning of his exaltation. Are you listening to me? So whatever you're facing, don't let your attitude change. Stay in the attitude of love and faith and prayer, you know. And, 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 and say, God, thank you in this situation. You sh- if you don't understand everything, be honest. Say, God, I don't understand all that's happening. But if there's one thing I understand, it is you. I may not understand the circumstances, but I understand you. You are light and in you there is no darkness at all. And though you slay me, yet will I praise you. I thank you for this situation now. Show me what's going on. They start praying in the spirit. And you know what? God will show you. He doesn't leave us in darkness. Are you listening to me? And what, what God and incidentally the devil are always looking at when we're in a difficult is our, our attitude. Once the attitude goes wrong, Satan says, I told you. <laughs> I t- That's what he said about Job. That's how we know. Satan is a very terrible person. He, taunt, he taunted God. He said, he said, he said yeah, he says, he's only serving you because you put a hedge around him and he's enjoying. Let, let's just test. Let's remove these things and let him have a few problems. He will curse you to your face. I you know it almost happened. Now, it didn't happen with Job, but the wife. And Satan knew he had, he had somebody on the inside that could, a fifth column that could prick Job. Thank God Job didn't yield to it. The wife said, you are mad. You pray, 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 church, church, church. You know, all this, you're, you good, good, good to everybody. You know, help everybody. Say you are serving God, sacrifice every day. See, see all your, all your servant of this, your God. You served him, served him, served him. He killed all our children in one day. All our money has gone. You better curse God and die. Sound familiar? That's where the real test is. And Job passed it. 
Job passed it. He didn't, he didn't, he, he wasn't perfect, but he passed that test. His attitude to God did not change. Your attitude to God must never change, no matter what is happening. That's where the test is. I'm not talking to anybody here. Okay. So now let's move on. So in verse 11, it says, To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now he's closing this letter, and we're going to move into the second one and uh, see where God takes us before we close. You know, and he says, uh, By Silvanus, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. The same thing as Silas. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly. These guys always say they write briefly. And you look at all the things we've been preaching for how many weeks. You know, Peter said, you know, just, this is just a brief word of exhortation. I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. This is John Mark, the same John Mark, you know, who was Barnabas' uh, 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 sister's son. You know, and there, there was a church in a, there was there's a, there was a city called Babylon. This is not symbolic now. This is you know there is a symbolic Babylon, but there was an actual physical location called Babylon, and there was a church there. You know, and uh, and, and 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 Peter used to go around. You know, so he was telling them that the guys at Babylon are saying hi. You know, and then he says, verse fourteen: Greet, greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. So he ends the, this beautiful letter, you know, saying they should, you know, uh, greet one another, you know, uh, with, a, with an attitude of love, you know, and, uh, and peace will be upon all of them. Then we go into Second Peter. These two epistles are different. You, they're, not, they're different in the sense that they were written probably at different times. But it was same P, uh, 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 Simon Peter that wrote them. Now, we're just going to look at the first four verses for this morning. Everybody read along with me. Say, Simon Peter. I didn't hear you. A servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't you never say, your, pre- your faith is precious. Ooh. You know, most people don't realize how precious this faith is. You know, when you say precious, people think of things like gold, diamonds. Ah, oh, that is very precious. And that's not wrong, but this is much more precious. I, will, I wish Christians would value the preciousness of their faith to the degree that they should. You know, people value, value uh, things like uh, diamonds and, and gold. If somebody has a gold ring or an earring or a necklace or something and anything happens to you, you see the way they start looking for it because it's precious, isn't it? Don't let anything happen to your faith. It is precious. And let me tell you something, it is the most precious thing you will ever have. There is nothing in this earth that even comes close to being as precious as your faith. That's why the Apostle Peter, you know, uses this wonderful uh, adjective here to describe our faith. He says, precious faith. Through the right standing, I'm paraphrasing, of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. You know, in Isaiah 54, it says, there are righteousnesses of me. See, righteousness, you have to understand it in two ways. There's right standing and there's right doing. Actually, both of them are of Jesus. The right standing gives you the ability to stand before God without guilt or condemnation. Not because you have not done wrong, but because Jesus' blood has cleansed you. So, it is a righteousness, a right standing that the Lord Jesus Christ gives you. Then, right doing... When you now have that right standing, the same Jesus gives you his life and the power of his Holy Spirit to do the right thing. So both the right standing as well as the right doing come from Jesus Christ. 
That's why it says their righteousness is of me. It's not of themselves. It's not, it's, 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 the, 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 the right standard, which is the foundation for the right doing, did not come because of what they do right or wrong. Because they get it because of their faith in me. That's what Peter had at the back of his mind. He said, like unto precious faith is us through the righteousness of our God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Notice how he links Jesus both as God and Savior. See, many Christians... You know, sometimes we, we lose sight, if we're not careful, we could lose sight. I don't think we, we, we forget or anything like that, but I think the significance of it sometimes eludes our hearts because we're so used to seeing Jesus as a man, which he is. I'm not taking that away at all. But you know, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ became a man. He stripped himself of his divine attributes, but he never stopped being God. He was just God operating at a lower level. Temporarily, in order to be able to have the legal foundation to save man, one, and two, so that man can partake of the same divine nature that he has. Give the Lord a clap offering. That's why. That's why. But he's still God. And particularly now that he's been raised from the dead and he's been restored to the right hand of God the Father, he's as much God as he was before anything ever happened. Are you listening to me? And you need to give him that honor and respect. And that's what Peter said. Our God and Savior. Yes, our Savior, he came down, became a man, died on the cross and all of that. But he's our God. Hallelujah. And that's why it irks me, still does, but now I've... I'm growing spiritually, and I'm learning self-control and kindness and patience. I'm trying to be, um, by the grace and mercy of God, I'm sweeter now than I used to be. I used to be, I used to get so angry when people start comparing Jesus with all these religious leaders. Like Jesus, only my genius, I say, in Yoruba language, that means the head is far from the leg. You know, there are some comparisons you shouldn't even make. It's an insult. Where are you starting from? How can you compare the creation with the creator? Nonsense and rubbish. Jesus is not in the, is, there is, there is not in the class of any religious leader. They are men. They are created men with sin. He is their creator and their savior. And the sooner they wake up to it, the better. I don't know if you understand. That's why the scripture says, and I like this because it was written by John, one of the closest apostles to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Just stop there. We will go further, but just stop there and let it sink in. Is not is not in your class. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Just stop. That's how you get to know who he is. He's God. The other revelation that comes out of that, and this other scripture, is that God is more than one person. Now is why he is God and with God. He's God, but he's also with God. So it means that God is more than one person. That's why you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when God introduces himself to us in the Bible, he never introduced himself to us as a singular person. The beginning of the Bible says, let us. Us, plural, Father, Son, and Holy, make man in our image and after our likeness. And the, 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 the Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim is God's in plural. Hallelujah. Let's know who we're talking about. It used to get me very, I don't get angry anymore. I just, you know, the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. Even if you, even if you are right, you can be right in a wrong way. The wrong attitude. I just get really angry. 
you know, you know, when I was a younger Christian and I got revelation and I knew, ah, can you, Jesus, ah, I, can we fight you for that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But now I just know, you know, the Bible says you should comfort the feeble-minded. Somebody who is comparing Jesus with, with, with any other, he's just feeble-minded. He doesn't understand. So let's just pray for him. And instead of getting angry and <laughs> praise the Lord, <laughs> really feeble-minded. There is no basis for comparison. And, and, and we say this every Christmas, and we say it at Easter, so that humanity we know. God arranged that the most powerful nations in the world that have brought the greatest amount of uh, scientific and, 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 and financial and uh, civilization to the world were nations that embraced the faith of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about nations in their history. Therefore, it, whether you like it or not, whether you believe in Jesus or not, every day you write a date, you are acknowledging Jesus is the center of human history. Give the Lord a clap offering. In the year 2017, year what? In the year of our Lord, uh, my Lord and your Lord, whether you accept him or not. You are going to accept him one day. Whether you like it or not, you can accept him on this side of heaven and go to heaven. Or you can accept him on the other side, God forbid. And if that happens to you, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whether you say it willingly or not, a day will come when you will have to say it. So you better say it now. And get the benefit. Thank you. I think I'm done. <laughs> I've made my point. Like they say in the court of law, the prosecution or the defense rests. I rest. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Now let's go to the next verse. Grace and peace. We just done only one verse. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whew. Whoa. Hallelujah. Grace and peace. What is grace? Grace is the favor of God that causes him to release a measure of his life and power. That's the, that's, that's the, that's the correct complete spiritual understanding of grace you know it was called unmerited favor which is true because you, you can't do anything to earn it god gives it to you you know uh because of his mercy his goodness you know but the point i want to really emphasize here is you know we obtain this grace through faith that's why he said like precious faith through the knowledge of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now he says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you see two persons of the Godhead. Actually, it's three. The Holy Spirit is there, it's just that it's not explicit. The, 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 the Father and the Holy Spirit and then the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, it be multiplied. In other words, this grace that we have received in Christ is a grace that is supposed to increase and grow. That's why it has to do with measure. So you receive the grace when you get born again. Ephesians 2.8, quickly give it to me. The Bible says, you know, by grace are you saved through faith. And that of yourself, not of works. By grace are you saved through faith. Everybody say grace through faith. Say faith. Faith. Believing in God. Believing God is, believing Jesus came, believing Jesus died, believing Jesus was raised again from the dead. Faith in that gives you access to God's mercy and favor. Grace that gives you access to life. That's the order. Faith, grace, life. What God actually gives is life. Grace is a virtue. Grace is a, is a disposition of heart. Do you understand? Of God's goodness. Of God's kindness. Are you listening to him? That now causes him to release his life. 
when you have faith. There is no other way he can give you life. Because he cannot give you life based on performance. Your performance can never be good enough. That's why Jesus had to die. If God was to reward you for how well you do, you will never get eternal life. It's impossible. That was the point God was trying to make through the animal sacrifices instituted to Israel. And he said, the man that doeth this thing shall live by them, knowing that they will never be able to live by it. (laughs) By the works of the Lord shall no flesh be justified. So you can never get eternal life or God's life and nature through doing things. You can only get it by believing in someone. His name is Jesus. It's when you believe in the Lord Jesus and his substitutionary sacrifice, then God can then give, he, can, he, now, he will now release a measure of eternal life, firstly into your spirit to recreate it and get it born again. But this scripture reveals to us that God, you don't want to stop there. That says a great and be multiplied. In other words, the measure of the life and the power of God that is available is infinite. And if you maintain that attitude of faith and humility, the greater measures of grace and mercy will be given unto you. Use the word multiply. You know, back in those days, you know, it was. Uh, education has increased, knowledge has increased down through the years, you know. <laughs> but even back in then, they knew the difference between multiplication and addition. Hello? Hello? I don't even know that 5 plus 5 is 10. But 5 times 5 is 25. So 5 times 5 is twice bigger than 5 plus 5. And so on and so forth. Don't let's go into any math class now. Praise the Lord. Amen? That's why he didn't use added. He said, grace and peace be multiplied. The way the, 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 the life of, the measures of the life and power of God are ministered to us. God does not minister it unto us by addition. He ministers it to us by multiplication. Give the Lord a clap offering. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is why if you continue in, in, in faith, you know, and in, in, in humility, God gives grace to the humble. If you continue, the more humble you are, the greater the measure, and it's going to be multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. Then it gets what's called without measure. Amen. That's where we're going. The word without measure, I got to close, is like the word infinite. You know, in mathematics, we have something that's called infinity. It's a difficult mathematical concept. You know, people write all kinds of philosophical, people write papers on it. But I'm not, I'm not going to go there. You know, let, let's say it in a simple way, very big. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor, uh, Prof. Super big. That's the meaning of infinity. Infinity means the thing is so large. Let me, let me use some <coughs> numbers to try and illustrate what I'm talking about. You know, if you say... If you say 1,000, it's big. You say 10,000, it's big. You say 100,000, it's big. 1 million, it's big. Like our politicians, they like, they don't operate at these lower levels. Another message for another day. Are you listening to me? They say 1 billion. 1 billion is 1 million times 1,000. Then you say 1 trillion. 1 trillion is 1 billion times 1,000. If you use mathematical some things, you know, t- if you multiply 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, times, 6 times, you get 1 million. If you do it ten, 9 times, you get 1 billion. If you do it 12 times, you get 1 trillion. Now, what happens when you do it 20 times? We don't have a word for it. There is no word in the English language. We have billion. I think they have zedillion, you know, which is, I think, 10 to the power 15. You know, nobody else, nobody yet has started talking in those orders of magnitude. 10 to power 20, then 10 to power 50, then 10 to power 100. Hello. Hello. Uh-huh. You begin to understand the concept of infinity. That's big. 
So if, if I'm operating at the level of 10 to power 100, that's 10 times 10, 100 times. And somebody is talking about 10. So you can see that 10 is totally insignificant. That is how tiny man is. Respect to God. I'm just, I, I, I'm trying to explain. But it just gives you a little bit of an idea. You can now understand God says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. You can understand what Solomon said, well, heavens, the heavens can't contain thee. You're looking at a God who is infinite. So when you get born again, he gives you 10. Mm, get born again, start. Then you start, you start praying, groaning and all that. Boom, then it goes to 100. You start praying, 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 then yes to 1,000. Praying, praying, praying. It's grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Then after a while, you move to 100,000. Then after some, you move to a million. Then after a while, you move to a billion. Then compared to the guys who are 10 around you, you look like one bigger guy. <laughs> Cast out the devil. But to God, you're nothing. <laughs> Never forget it. Amen. See, once you're, once you're at the level of a billion, and there are people who are still operating at 10, you're so much bigger than them. If you're not careful, you start thinking you're God. Oh. But you're not God. You can never be God. God is not 10 to 100. He's more than that. I only use that as an illustration. There is no end. Give the Lord a clap offering. Let's know, let's know the person we're dealing with. Who. Now, I'll tell you something else. I've got to close. Hallelujah. I remember like, getting something out of this. <laughs> Amen. Now, let me tell you something. You know, in order to relate to us, do you understand? In order, <laughs> if he's at that level, he can't relate to us. He'd be, he'd be a giant. We can't even see his nose. <laughs> so God will just it's called miniaturization we even do it now that's why we now have you know nanobots these are robots at the nano level man is you know trying to just do a little bit of what god does all the time you know so god so he can relate to all of us then his infinite power he keeps it somewhere it's called the fullness of the godhead then he can he can he can be here talking to you at your level do you understand? I'm talking to Pastor Boy. He's praying and asking God for this. God, please help me with my finances. Help me with this. Help me. And he's relating to you at that level. But at the same time, do you understand? He's still up there. He's still holding all things together. So what you're asking for is very small. Say, don't worry. We have enough resources. <laughs> don't worry, lads. You know, he's telling you, you know, that's why he says, he says, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. In everything by prayer and supplication, just let me know what you need. Huh? The fact that Pastor Kwege is asking, and Prof is asking, and Pastor Wale is asking, Pastor Tunji is asking, Pastor Ulubi is asking, he's not denting. It has no effect on my treasury. <laughs> never be overwhelmed he's not a careless creator everything he has made is just a very small thing compared to what he is you can now understand the scripture of him through him and to him are all things and the scripture says you know uh, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think think it <laughs> think it there is more resources inside God to do exceedingly, uh, not what you thought to, exceedingly, abundantly, above what you thought. That's why you should honor God. And that's why you respect God. And that's why those four beasts and 24 elders, you know, say, holy, holy, holy. They would have just seen one dimension. 
Then maybe a few hours later, they will see another dimension. Holy, holy, holy. When you think you've seen it all, God will not open another dimension. It is true. It is not flattery. God is great. Stand to your feet. I got to close. I'll take you from there in my next lesson. God is great. And he's not, you know, he's a humble person in his character. So he comes down to our level to relate with us, talk with us, you know, joke, chat, eat, sleep with us, you know, like Jesus did, you know. But it doesn't change who he is. Now, this will interest you and bless you. When Jesus was here as a man, he was operating at our level. He, you know, the Bible says, who thought he not robbed to be equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. So he, he, took, he, he removed that infinity from himself. So he, he didn't know everything at the same time. He wasn't everywhere at the same time. He didn't have all power at the same time. But when he reached the age of 30 and he had developed himself, you know, God had, you know, the Holy Spirit had helped him to grow and develop himself spiritually, God gave him a supply line to that infinity. Is what we were teaching about the other day, the fullness of God. He gave him permanent access. To that infinity. So whenever he needed it, he'll just say, I will. And the thing will come from the he's still at our level, though, but it will come through him and get the job done. That's why when Thomas said, It suffices us to show us the Father. Jesus said, Could I go could he a year? He said, You don't understand. He said, Have I been so long with you and you don't know me? He said, he that has seen me, has seen the Father. But they had asked Jesus, you know that same thing he wants to give us? They said that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. He wants us, you and I, to grow to the place spiritually where we also have access to the infinity. Permanently. So when, whenever we need it, whatever is needed here, you know, whether it's to raise somebody from the dead, or you know, or to have incredible photographic memory, whatever that is needed, you just tap it. It doesn't stay in you permanently. Your body can't contain it. You understand? There's no way, you know, you, 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 the, the, the finite cannot come. The finite cannot contain the infinite, but the finite can have access to the infinite. Cos Selemen Gardofrenes. I'm going to repeat that. The finite cannot contain the infinite. It's not possible. But the finite can have access to the infinite. So once you have permanent access to the infinite, whatever is here that you need, you can get it from the infinite and deal with it. You know another word for it? Dominion. It's called kingdom. You, you become kingdom. You now, you now become a king. You, so, he says you shall reign as a king in life. Why? You now have access to an infinite measure of the life of God. For now, you don't. That's why the grace given to you by measure for now but if you develop yourself like jesus did that grace and peace will be multiplied after a while you will have access to infinite but he doesn't give it to you initially no because he, he, imagine imagine an irresponsible person having access to the infinity we would all be dead he would he would he would, he would destroy the planet he just, ah, the whole thing would just <laughs> spin out of. <laughs> so that's why the first thing God does is develop your character. When your character and you become rooted and grounded in love, aha, uh -huh, he says, this one is ready. I can give him access to the infinite. Then he can start doing the works that I do, shall he do, and greater. Talk to God.
Let's talk to God. Is it clear? Make it clear. That's why I use numbers. You see, if I didn't use numbers and took you from 10 to 1,000, you won't get it. You see, by looking at the progression, you can now see how big God is and how small we are. Relatively. He says he holds the nations in the palm of his hand. Give me Isaiah 40. You can understand why I used to get angry when people start comparing Jesus with all these people. <laughs> Isaiah 40 verse 31. Towards the end. Where it says, you know. No, no. 30, 28, 29, somewhere there. You know, move up, move up. Aha. Has thou not known? Turn to your neighbor. Say, God is talking to you and I. Has thou not known? Has thou not heard? That God. The everlasting God. The Lord. The creator of the ends of the earth, he faints not. Don't your neighbor say, how can infinity faint? <laughs> Neither is weary. And there is no searching of his understanding. That is why the stupidest thing Satan ever did was to rebel against God. How can the finite regale against the infinite? You know the outcome. Before the battle starts. <laughs> Next verse. He giveth power to the faint. I didn't hear you. And them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth. No, this is not the scripture I want. There's a scripture where it says, you know, verse 12. Thank you. 12 to 15. Yeah, that's the one I want. Who? This is God. He's telling you relatively, not even absolutely. He's just, he, he's giving us a small picture. Of how powerful and great he is. Go to verse 11. Good. Then verse 12. Who hath measured. I, oh, open your mouth. The waters. In the hollow. Of his hand. Now everybody think a little bit. About the Atlantic Ocean. The Pacific Ocean. The Indian Ocean. And all the oceans in the world, and just put it as a drop in your palm. You begin to have a small idea, not the total, of how big God is. But we're not done yet. And may, meet it out the heaven with a span. The span of my hand is the distance between my thumb and my foremost finger, like that. That's my span. Now, can you imagine the whole of outer space? What we were showing you the other day. Do you understand? Now, it doesn't even cover, you know, because we have first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. All of them, boom. And comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. And weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Next verse. Who are directed the spirit of the Lord or her, being his counselor have taught him. Next verse. With whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding. Next verse. Behold the nations Nigeria, America, Russia, China, India, as a drop of a bucket. They're not a bucket to a drop. And as counted as the small dust of the balance, behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Give the Lord another clap of praise. God is... The only thing that is restricting God in his operations with us is the fact he's a God of righteousness and justice. It has nothing to do with power. If God doesn't seem to do something, it's because one, he doesn't violate his word and doesn't want to violate man's free will. And this planet is so small. 
and it's so delicate. God has to be careful. <laughs> so he just ooh, just enough. Just so that everything can go the way he wants it to go. Amen. That's why don't get God angry. That's why he told Moses that day. He said, These silly ones. They've tempted me this ten times. He said, move out. I'll just let a little something come out. And I'll destroy them as one man. And I'll make of you a great nation. And he meant it. Moses said, the Holy Spirit, that's not a good idea, Lord. People will say, you, didn't, you know, you brought them here to kill them. God said, point. All right. We'll deal with them another way. Over the next 40 years, not one of them will enter the promised land. And not one entered. Except for Joshua and Caleb. As God is powerful. God is great. And that's why we should treat him with respect and honor and consider it a great honor and privilege that he wants to share his infinity with us. Give us access to it like Jesus had access to it when he was here. That's, what he, that's where he's going. I say, you're God's. He wants us to be like that. And then other men will say, ha, where are you getting this from? He said, the God of hell. Then they'll come and kneel down and say, surely God is in thee. Say, and you know what follows that? Please teach me about your God. I want to know your God. He says, the, the, the man of the Lord's house shall be excelled above all the hills. And all nations shall flow into it. For the word of the Lord shall come from Jerusalem. And people will come to know. The, the end time church, people are going to come for the knowledge of God. Not just for miracles. Miracles will be so common, it won't be important. We will have miracles, though. Don't misunderstand me. But people will not become to church because of miracles. You can get miracles from the boy living on your road downstairs who has the borrowed anointing. You don't need to come to church to get miracles. You can get miracles by touching the car of somebody who is anointed or walking by them in the, in the in shop right. But to get the wisdom of God, you have to come to church. That's what's coming. Hallelujah. Let's talk to God. What then shall we say to these things? And you know the important thing, Pastor G, none of this is in my notes. None of it. I just said one or two things in my notes. I had no idea I was going to go to this. But you know, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. So, so, so let, let's, let's all talk to God. Where did we start from? Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. That's where we started from. Grace and peace. So this knowledge of God, this being born again, coming to knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord, it gives me access to great multiplication of grace and peace to the point where I can tap into the infinite and use it in this realm. And that's what you should be came for as a Christian. Stop all this, just come to church and sing choruses, you know, and ask God for biscuits and cake and <laughs> praise the Lord. I'm not talking to anybody here. You know, it's all childish stuff. It's okay because we start as babies and little children. But after some time, God expects you to start seeing beyond that. You're not coming to God to ask God, kill my enemy. God, do this. God, give me a new clothes. God, give me visa. God, give me car. All those things are, they're, they're, they're insignificant compared to the infinite mercy and the grace and the glory of God that God wants to make available to you. You will still get those things. You use the, to get all those things because you need them in this lifetime. But you know, that's not the reason why you're chasing after God. I'm chasing after the infinite. Hallelujah. Let's talk to him. In your presence, we are content. We are content. 
nations of your love, revelations of your power and mind. Father, we confess our sins, especially sins of unbelief or fear. Receive the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name we have life. Lord, have mercy on us as we pray. Our Father, I thank you for your word that has come to me today, reminding me that I have a precious faith that gives me access to your favor through which your power and life can be multiplied unto me unto an infinite amount giving me access to all of the power of God oh my God what a precious faith what a precious faith Lord have mercy on me help me understand the treasure I have help me not to despise it like Esau, who despised his birthright. Oh God, have mercy on me. Help me not despise this precious faith, but rather take advantage of it and have access to greater and greater and greater and greater measures of your grace, measures of your mercy, so that I can manifest your glory, your goodness, your mercy, 
your blessings to the people around me so that they will come and say, we want to know your God. Oh God, oh God, oh God, have mercy on me to be faithful, to live worthy of this high calling in Christ Jesus that you have called me unto to have ultimately access to all the fullness of God in Jesus' name. Ne kataloma tolomo shto fredefres. Le krama tu friniash. Ze frio kordolo mashala. Le ngatu ske fridigo. Ne rantu ske fridinga talaya kokofre. Lombro komo tolosh. Lombri kitolo. Lombro komo tu fredefres. Ze lengaro. Zo kokoko. Tolomo tolo lombro du fredefresingaros. Tulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulomotulom
but made himself of no repetition. He humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant. And being found in fashion, he became obedient unto death. Jesus did what he didn't feel like doing. He didn't feel like going to the cross. That's the, that's the textbook definition of humility. Submitting to the will of God when you don't feel like it. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. That's what he felt like. But he didn't do what he felt like. He did what was the will of God. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. God said, give him infinite measure. Give him. Amen. He went to hell, spent three, just the minimum number to get the legal basis fulfilled. Once it was fulfilled, the glory of God came down and blasted his way in that place and raised him from the dead. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. How did it come? Humility. When you don't feel like eating, when you don't feel like fasting, fast. When you don't feel like taking a lower position, take it. When you don't feel like accepting rebuke, take it. When you don't feel like every time any of your feeling comes against the, 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 the word of God, what the word of God wants is an opportunity to increase your, your humility. Do it. You know you're going to get more grace. More grace. More grace. More grace. More grace. Any time the word of God is contrary to your feeling, recognize as an opportunity for more grace. That's how the, it's going to be multiplied until the point where you get the infinite. God bless you. On the Air has been brought to you by Christ Life Ministries, the outreach arm of the Scripture Pastor Christian Center. You can be a part of this program by becoming a faith partner with Christ Life Ministries. For details, contact Christ Life Ministries, number 12, Oshichoku Avenue, Bodija Ibadan. You can also download our weekly messages from our website, www.spcconline.org, while our email address is scripturepastor at spcconline.org. You're welcome to worship with us at the Scripture Pastor Christian Center Auditorium, Polytechnic Road, Sango Ibadan. God bless you.